Howdy ho, what's crackin' lackin' everybody? Uh, it's Old Cracky Gamer, and we're in 1902. Uh, as you can see, I, I did some spring training. I think I did the lowest. Maybe I did the default. I'm not so sure. But it's only it was only 18 games. And you can see here that the uh, Baltimore Orioles, uh, the Athletics, seem to have taken a jump. Uh, and speaking of jumping, a lot of players have jumped. And we'll go through those in a little, a little bit. Uh, the Tigers, who finished 1902, really like one of the worst records Tigers ever had are 10 and 8 here. So it looks like somebody may be overachieving. Uh, also, I know there's an individual that likes to uh, watch these videos, and I, I thank you very much, sir. Uh, but uh, I know they're, they know uh, the nicknames. And, yes, the Boston Americans were not uh, technically called the Boston Somersets. Uh, but uh, Charles Summers was, he had stock in at least four American League teams. And his coal money was essentially what kept the American League afloat. He, he was the money and Johnson was the practitioner. Um, and the uh, statesman of the American League. Therefore, Boston was, you know, they were called the Somersets uh, by a lot of news uh, papers. And I just thought it'd be nice. If the Red Sox went through a couple of nicknames before they got to the Red Sox. I also do, I do enjoy the Pilgrims and there are, Cy Young's statue in Boston does have, he was a Pilgrim when he pitched in the first World Series. And I do like that. Boston Pilgrims is a really nice one. Uh, a really nice nickname. Uh, John Taylor, who was the inept son of the owner after uh, Charles Sumner uh, Summer had to, uh, had to sell uh, because the coal industry kind of went down in his money and he started losing, which is a sad tale. Charles Sumner Summer uh, Sumner uh, created the American League, and then by the time he was just he lost it all. He lost it all, and uh, I think he built up a little bit to you know to not be poor, of course. But, uh, yeah, he kept this thing afloat with his money, and uh, at the end, he suffered greatly for it. But what are you going to do? You know, so uh, great. You just got to honor the, the, the man for doing so. Uh, you see the Chicago's White Stockings. They are still called the White Stockings. It was right here in 1902 where a lot of the newspaper writers started shortening it to socks simply to save on printing because you could not create different fonts and sizes as easily back then with the news, newspaper print. So in order to fit the whole story on the page, they lowered stockings to white socks. So it technically, you know, one of the few teams where their team name was created just from, uh, <coughs> just from journalists trying to, you know, get a good headline in. The Cleveland Bronchos, uh, again, they were still technically known as the Bluebirds. They were kind of known as the Bronchos here, or the Broncos, depending on what journalism a journalist uh, was talking about and what news beat writer was talking about them. But again, I like to. They have a nice new logo. They did change their logo back then to some this block C, and therefore I like to change it to the Broncos, and then. Later on, it would be the Naps because Nat Lajoy would go there, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, last in the American League, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League. The Washington Senators are still there. St. Louis Browns, as you can see, new team, new colors. Um, I think I think they're, they're dark maroon. I'm not so sure. I can't tell that color. But from all accounts, that's what they used to be. They should be a lot better than this. They grabbed a lot of players from the St. Louis Cardinals. Pittsburgh Pirates, as you can see now, uh, during during this time in America, well, actually, at the late 1890s, early 1900s, they started doing the uh, putting the H at the end of Bergs, and so this is how it, it is technically known. And so now they're back up to what they're supposed to be. Uh, the Spurvers, Bean Eaters, Orphans are still called the Orphans right now, um, and the Phillies and the Cardinals they got hit by jumpers a lot. So you will see their team. Uh, now, 1902 is known for two big things. One, it is 
Well, two big things, and I, I always put a third in here. The two big things were it was a war inside the American League. The Baltimore Orioles were a good team. McGraw put a, together a good team. He grabbed some more players for 1902. However, he, they also had an owner uh, who I can't recall the name, So, uh, but it was an owner that was friends with McGraw, and he, he ran into some financial trouble. Giants and brush of the Reds. Uh, but I think Friedman was with the Reds during this time. It, it, it's kind of floppy when it comes to ownership and everything. Brush will become the Giants owner. So technically it doesn't really matter. However, they, they helped this guy out. And in doing so, McGraw also ran into a bunch of issues with Van Johnson about how a player should act, how a team should act, how a manager should act, what he wanted to relay to the masses. It wasn't the rough and tumble stuff. Van Johnson won a good product on the field and a professional product, a polished professional product, which in the end worked. Uh, but John McGraw didn't see it as such. So he had a nice falling out with them and they tore apart Friedman McGraw and Brush tore apart the Orioles in June or July of this year. A lot of a lot of the players went to the Giants. A lot of players went to the Reds. Some scattered to the Winds. So by that time, Van Johnson took over ownership of the team, and just had to fill it with uh, whoever he could. There was a lot of loaning out, that type of thing. That was the big. That was the big big thing in 1902, and it also created the war between the National League and the American League. The second thing that happened was the jumping. A lot of jumping. It was basically free agency going wild uh, during this time. Even when free agency broke uh, in the 70s, it was not as bad as it was during this time where players were jumping and a contract meant nothing until they came to a peace accord in 1904. Um, and the third thing, which isn't well known, but to me it's well known, this is the season of the Hard luck rookies, just in life, just in life. A lot of rookies from 1902 either died early from disease, suicide. Uh, their careers just got stagnated because of bad trades or they jumped. You know, there's very few of the 1902 uh, rookies that actually came out uh, ahead of things in life. Lou Drill is the only one I can think, and he became a district attorney. So if you think badly about lawyers, that might be not a, a good thing. Um, no, no, there is there is one decent guy, but uh, again, his career went downhill uh, quickly. And that guy is Carl Lundgren. Let me see Carl Lundgren. Carl Lundgren, a lot of people don't know who Carl Lundgren is, and you wouldn't. He's one of those guys that were at the bottom of the rotation of the Cubs. So you, there was... Uh, Robeck, uh, Weimer, Mordecai Brown, those types of guys. And then there was Carl Lundgren. Now, Carl Lundgren, his big thing was he was very good, and I can relate to this. So this guy I, I remember fondly. He was good in April, May, and a little bit of June. Then when the weather got hot, oh, he just he stunk. He could not take the heat. And then when September rolled around, he was good again. But unfortunately, that's during the dog days of summer, that was a very important part of a lot of these pennant races. Uh, they were won, not in September, but usually in August when you could uh, go through all those hot weather days and roll off 10 in a row. So Carl Lundgren was sort of known as this uh, lackadaisical guy when the fact is, it's, I mean, I just can relate to him. It, the hot weather just drains me. So that was that's interesting about him. Um, with uh, he became a, he later became a coach. Uh, I forgot what what college he, he became a coach for somebody, and so he he went down there and uh, he didn't have overpowering stuff. I remember that for Lundgren, he didn't really have overpowering stuff. Not a great curve by any means, but uh, he just kept the ball down, and that's. That's essentially it. But um, I think maybe maybe it was where is he? Illinois. Maybe it was the maybe it was the College of Illinois where he became a coach. 
But he was, yeah. So he was probably the only good. He's probably the only good story out of this. Uh, the the saddest story, of course, and he is now in the starting rotation after playing in the minors last year and doing decently, but not so great, is Addie Joss. Addie Joss is the only player that I know of. I'm pretty sure he's the only player uh, that was elected to the Hall of Fame with less than 10 years of baseball. And the reason was is that he died of meningitis right at the height of his career. He was second in, he's second in all-time ERA behind Ed Walsh who is in the minors here for Chicago. And he is the reason that they had the very first all-star game uh, to raise money for his family. And I think they raised, God, it had to be about $25,000, which is was a hell of a lot of money during this time. But uh, Billy Sunday was a, a former ball player, and he became an evangelist. And his eulogy was the was at the time one of the largest in Toledo, Ohio's history. And uh, Billy Sunday said, Josh tried to strike out death, and it seemed for a time as if he would win. The bases were full. The score was tied with two outs, thousands, yes, millions of the nation's grandstands and bleachers sat breathless watching the conflict. The great twirler stood erect in the box, and death walked to the plate. 12914 so that's pretty much in today's money. That was over $100,000, I believe, for the family. So that was the first All-Star game. And uh, he did have he does have a nickname. So I don't know why it didn't pull down. But his nickname was a very good one. It was called the Human Hairpin. Simply because... All right, not simply because. Stop, stop with those crutch words. Uh, he, he used the Human Hairpin. And he garnered this nickname simply because he could spot the ball wherever. He had great control. He had a nice fast, he had a plus fastball, plus change up, a plus curve. All his pitches were marvelous. But his the ability for him to throw it exactly where he wanted, when he wanted, is the reason he became so great. Uh, and he has a couple of uh, no-hitters to his name. Other ones, uh, you know, I, I changed his height. Saber said he was smaller. And I'm, I'm about to say yes. You know, 5'3", 135 pounds, that was basically average during this time. Maybe it was 5'4", but uh, it, people weren't big back then before we started putting all this stuff in our food and guys started getting boobs. Uh, you know, that's kind of, but uh, yeah, when the, people were six foot, that's why they call them Big Ed, Big uh, Long Bob, because it was unusual to be six foot back then. Anyways, he's a uh, brother of uh, Kid Gleason. Um, which is the second baseman for the Detroit Tigers right now and was also the man that uh, managed the uh, Black Sox in 1919 and was played very well by the guy who played Frazier's dad. I don't remember Kelsey Grammer's show there, the one on NBC. It was a very good show. He played the Frazier's dad, and he did a hell of a job playing Kid Gleason. But uh, his, his defense, his versatility, he's a decent speed guy. Um, he's got decent range everywhere. And so, but he couldn't hit a lick. So he got, he got dropped and then he finally made a comeback after going to the minor leagues. But his big thing was he almost died. Rube Waddell through, he was playing, he, he replaced an injured, uh, Dick, uh, Dick Patton there, you know, Dick brains. So he replaced him and he had two hits, including a triple against Rube Waddell. Now, Rube was kind of faltering during this part. This was after his A's day, athletic days, and he was at, with the Browns at this time. Well, Rube tried to shoot it inside and hit Gleason in the back of the head, like right behind his left ear. So that was pretty much inside. Um, and uh, not too far inside, but enough. You know, it just, he didn't get out of the way in time. So all the players rush, and Waddell was one of the first guys because, you know, Rube took this stuff real personal. Um, and uh, they called out the guy. He was a city health commissioner, and they called him from the stands. And then uh, they actually had a father, a priest, come in there, and uh, he came down, and he was about to give the last rites. They thought Gleason was going to be the guy. 
the die there at home plate. Uh, so Waddell carried him, and uh, blood was running from his nose and his ears. So that's that's pretty damn bad. Um, and they tore the clubhouse door, and they used it as a stretcher. And the ambulance came. He was critical condition, and he had concussion in the brain. Probably some blood on there as well. And Rube was they they played the next day. Because they cu- they cut the game short back then, you can uh, cut the game short and you can play it again. And they t- they played it again the next. Uh, they resumed it the next day, and Rube Waddell was distraught. He's totally ruined. Thought he killed some guy. And uh, it was about that time that Rube Waddell actually, um, Rube Waddell actually went downhill, and his career was almost gone after that. So yeah, Rube Waddell took those things to heart. But uh, yeah, that's that was his, and then um, I mean he bounced back, but uh, yeah he was never the he was kind of never the same again, uh, and he never did get that pure shot to become one one of the best uh, or one of the utility players on the Brown. Now uh, there's a lot of other guys. Got Ham Iberg. Uh, this guy played one game. Now look at him, Ham Iberg, or one season. He played one season. He he actually has the uh, season record for most losses for a guy who just played one season in the bigs. It was 18 losses. As you can see here, he's from San Francisco. So a lot of players during this time, and there's a guy in Brooklyn we'll meet later that is well renowned because he was, he did really well. He didn't lose 18 games. He did re- really well for Brooklyn. And then he went, nah, I'm, nah, I hate it here. And he just left to go out West. And so there are players of that nature during that time. And uh, Ben Johnson, um, the head of the AL, towards the end where people ripped apart his uh, his power, including uh, Frank Navin, who would later become uh, who would become who is the president, who would become the president of the Detroit Tigers and then the owner. He did not like uh, Ben Johnson so much. And then during uh, during some alt. During some disagreement with Charles Comiskey, his drinking buddy, Ben Johnson chose in favor of a player going somewhere else, I think to the Highlanders, instead of uh, the White Sox, and Comiskey just just blew up, and their friendship was never the same. So Ben Johnson, in the 20s, when Landis came, Navin and Comiskey sort of pushed Ben Johnson out of power, um, which is kind of sad as well. But that's what happens when you're kind of like the Donald Trump of your time. You are very polarizing. So, uh, Ban Johnson did all that kind of good stuff. And, and what I wanted to say was, Ban Johnson, towards the end of his life, stated that, you know, baseball should be coast to coast. It should be America's game, and we should do it coast to coast. And there was another plan that he was right on uh, that uh, eventually came. But uh, I just reminded of it when I see a lot of these players that spent one year, some did really, really good. And I think I'm, I'm trying to say it's Kaiser Wilhelm that was the player that did really well and went out west, but I think I'm mistaken on that one. But it was a player on Brooklyn. And when he comes up, I'll recognize the name because uh, I don't think he's even around now. I don't think it's one of these guys. There, there, there. Gene McCann was one of these guys that uh, he later became a scout for the Yankees. No, it's I, it's not one of these guys. So it's it's later down the road, when one of these players uh, just have a great year and go. Nah, I'm done with this. Uh, and another guy. A, a lot of players died of uh, Germany. Schaefer here, in Detroit was the clown prince. Uh, let's uh, look at him. Germany Schaefer should be on the. Yep, there he is. Germany Schaefer was clown prince, goofy looking guy. Uh, get thrown out for eating popcorn in third base. He's a guy that stole for first base. There was a double steal was the biggest thing to try to get one run when one run meant the difference between a win and a loss back then uh, or and would be the only score of the game sometimes. Uh, guy was on third. He's on first. He steals second base, but the catcher doesn't fall for the gambit because he's supposed to throw the second, and then when he throws the second, the guy at third is supposed to come home. So Germany Schaefer's on second. Then he starts leaning towards first base, which is very odd. Next pitch takes off, and he steals first base. 
uh, Hugh, I think it was Hugh Duffy that was the manager at the time, comes out and he just starts arguing. And I think it was, I, I think it was Donnelly. Donnelly was the, the, the even keel guy that knew the rules of the game. And he's just going, Hugh, there, I, what, what can I do? There's, there's no rule against that. <laughs> and he was going, this is preposterous. He's making a mockery of the game. And he was right. Later on the later down the road, about in the twenties, they would make a they would make a rule that states, you know, you can't steal first base. But anyways, next thing, Germany Schaefer takes off for second again. This time he's nailed, uh, or this time he's caught in a rundown. I believe he's caught in a rundown, and of course, guy from third. It might have been Davy Jones. Uh, it might have been Davy Jones that did that. So, uh, Davy or one of the guy, the guy whoever's on third tries to steal. And the guy in the pickup throws that, so he gets nailed there. But that that was that was one of his funny sayings. He'd come out and with uh, you know like Dummy Taylor before he'd come out with the uh, rain boots and galoshes uh, at to try to hit and uh, and to try to get a rain delay. And he got tossed more than once for doing that kind of stuff. Sometimes he gets sent back to just change. And then when he did that and came back, it would be pouring. So he got his way. Um, so yeah, Germany Schaefer was one of the clown princes. That's the funny story about him stealing first base. Uh, another, but here's one of the saddest stories. This poor guy. Imagine living in infamy as the worst ball player that ever played professional baseball. Now, professional baseball is usually from 1901 to present day. John Goschner holds that distinction for a lot of people. In fact, I think there was, a. Uh, that TV series bones, there was a guy that actually mentioned him as the worst ball player of all time, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, this guy, he had, he played for Brooklyn last year. As you can see, he did play for Brooklyn. He didn't do so bad, but in Cleveland, his problem was that he, he batted under 200. And in his first league year, I think he batted around 180, but he committed about 50 errors. So that's pretty bad. Even during this time, the second year, he commits 98 errors, which is an all-time record. And again, he batted under 200, and he had five errors in one game, another record. How he lasted that long is unbelievable. But for that purpose, a lot of people say Bill Bergen was the worst player because he lasted the longest, and he has he has a lot of records, like the worst the worst. Uh, batting average for people over this amount of at-bats. But then I'm talking about Bill Bergen here. Uh, his slugging being less than his on-base percentage or maybe vice versa. Bergen has a lot of those inept hitting uh, records for longevity. But Gauchner, 98 errors in one year with five in one game. The poor guy, this poor guy. And he just never, of course, he never saw a major league uh, again. So, geez. And you know what's the problem is? I think I read somewhere where people thought his name was spelled wrong. <laughs> so even that his name may be spelled wrong in all of this. I they I think there was supposed to be E here. Gotch, G-O-C-H-E-N-A-U-R. I think that's usually in the normal spelling of the name. So even his name might be horrible. Yeah, he's very unhappy too. He wants to be a bench player, but guess what? You're you're the starting shortstop, so why are you so mad? This is about as good as it's going to get for you, John Goshner. Anyway, so those those are the uh, things I remember out of baseball, and 1902 being one of them. Uh, let's look at the preseason predictions before we start off. Uh, the Athletics and the St. Louis Browns. You know this is this is pretty good. I look at the Browns. You can see the Browns. Uh, they took a lot of guys. They a lot of people jumped, and they they helped this along. Uh, Burkett, they got Mal- uh, Maloney stayed from Milwaukee, uh, but he'll be on his way soon. So Burkett, you got Hendrick Hydricks, who won or almost won the batting title in the NL last year. Um, John Anderson got hurt. Uh, John Anderson, our Swedish guy, who is pretty decent. So I traded him Jimmy Hart from Baltimore because. Jimmy Hart wasn't supposed to do this well last year, but he should stay in the league. So that's what I'm trading these guys around. I'm not going to just dump this guy um, like in real life. If he, he hit almost, he hit almost 300 and had a nice slugging of 392. 
So he's taken over while John Anderson is on the DL for a while. They got Bobby Wallace from St. Louis. So St. Louis, Cardinals, Cardinals, Cardinals. Uh, Dick Brains Patton uh, got him from the Cardinals. We'll see how he does after his, uh, his injury, which was, let me look at this, history, injury history. Yeah, ruptured Achilles tendon. He was out for months. So we'll see how he does. And they got Mike Cahoe from um, the Cubs, which 237 went a 307 sluggish for a catcher back then. Not bad. They also got Powell from St. Louis. Red Donahue from the Phillies, another team decimated by um, by uh, jumping and getting pirated. And then uh, St. Louis. And then Sudduff as well, St. Louis. Um, the athletics, they grabbed people from Philly as well. They grabbed, well, first they grabbed Hartzell from Chicago, who had a hell of a year last year. They grabbed Flick. Um, actually, you know what? Uh, they were known for another thing. I'm sorry. 1902 is also known for another thing. It is known as the Philly injunction. That's when the Phillies got really pissed at people stealing their players, uh, especially the athletics. So they put an injunction and they had a lawsuit in um, Philadelphia Supreme Court. And it was ruled in favor of the Phillies. So Flick and Lajoie, uh, who came here last year and had a hell of a year, probably this is what brought on the Phillies' hurt feelings, is that Lajoie had a record-breaking year. Um, these guys, in the end of April, will be pushed off to the Cleveland Nats. And they will not be able to play in the state of Pennsylvania until this thing's resolved in about 1904. So that's another thing that 1902 is known for. Um, they also grab Monty Cross, who's not a really good grab, to tell you the truth. He actually hit better in our sim than he hit in real life. He hit under 200 in real life. So they did grab Monty Cross, but they also grabbed Doug Obey, um, who he's 14 and 17, but he did pretty well. Uh, considering um and they grab yeah that's it they grabbed those guys but flick and bernard was pretty good i think bernard goes back to the phillies so instead of fighting it bernard is the one that goes yeah, all right I'll, I'll just go back to philly and just let it be so so that's another thing 1902 is known for so i do apologize for forgetting that they got the tigers at 7363 in real life, the Tigers finished last, I believe, which is odd. So, I mean, Barrett, they still got Barrett going strong. Kid Gleason. Well, these guys are doing a lot better. Like, Bulo did a lot better last year than he was supposed to. Holmes did well. Uh, Gleason did better than he did last year. And they picked up Harley from Cincinnati. And the pitchers, uh, Roscoe Miller actually did worse than he did in real life in 1901. Um, Seaver did better. Jaeger did better. So, yeah, that's that's just kind of odd uh, that Detroit's going to be that high up. Uh, Somersets, uh, who were the Americans last year and uh, lost the World Series, the very first World Series, our new World Series in 1901 instead of 1903. Uh, they're tending to go down early. Um, they only picked up Candy LeChance. I think I mentioned this last year, um, and so I was right in that assessment. They picked up Candy LeChance for Ossie Schreckengoss, who will later become uh, the catcher for Philadelphia. Not right now, he's in Cleveland. Um, now, they got Parent. I wonder if Parent, did I do his? Yeah, I think I did his errors way too much. Yeah, his he should be a little better in the air department and the infield range department. When I set these guys up, parents a pretty damn good uh, player. Uh, Chick Stahl, Chick Stahl is another. Oh, he's he's such a sad case. He he suffered from depression. He might have also been homosexual, which led to his suicide, where he drank carbonic carbonic acid, which was used for like a foot. Uh, a foot bunion or something at the time. Oh, excruciating death. Excruciating death. And the guy that was in the room with him was Jimmy Collins, and he was never the same again. It, it's just, it was very sad. He just got married, and I think maybe the guilt of that, 
Plus, he became the manager of the the Pilgrims uh, of the Boston Americans team. And, yeah, it's just sad, sad, sad. Uh, They also got Hickman from New York, who is going to start in left field. They do have this guy, Patsy Doherty, who will become a fan favorite, hopefully. But right now they got Charlie Hickman, and I think he'll be shipped off later. Of course, they got the great Cy Young, uh, Bill Deneen, uh, who was supposed to be very good during this time, but it looks like, I mean, it doesn't look like he's doing so well. Um, he might do a hell of a lot better this year. So this, he might be the deciding factor of whether the Somersets finish lower or higher in the American League. Ted Lewis, all these guys, Win Kellum's supposed to be gone, but Will Kellum won 20 games last year. Why would I dump him? So I'm making, I'm doing real life transactions, but I'm also using a, a thought process. The Orioles. Now, with the Orioles here, the way they were set up at the beginning of the year, I don't understand. I don't understand why they would be down so much. They should be one of the favorites to win the league. Uh, they grabbed Kip Selbick from the uh, the Giants. You look at him. He bet at 295 with a 351 on base percentage. That's amazing. They grabbed Gilbert, who did, had a hell of a year over in Milwaukee, batting 305 with a 363 slugging. Plus, I think he was in the running, I think. Oh, Jimmy, he's the guy I traded for Jimmy Hart. Okay, he's the guy I traded. Because he was in, he was actually a free agent, and he he picked up. So I just traded him over there. Dan McGann, the guy that won the uh, first base gold glove uh, for the Cardinals last year. I mean, these are great guys, so I don't understand. Uh, maybe it's just their pitching. Tom J. Hughes, this guy, didn't he win? He's the guy that won... Pitcher of the Month, All-Star Game, All-Star Game MVP honors. And he was the, oh, second. He finished second. So he finished second in uh, last year's uh, Pitcher of the Year award. So I don't understand why these guys are down so low. It really is odd. Harry Howe would play a lot of infield this year simply because these guys got ripped. Yeah, we'll look at these guys. I think this, I think Brody goes to the Giants. Cy Seymour goes to the, to the Reds. Selbick, I don't know where he goes. Jimmy Williams, Gilbert. McGann goes to the Giants. Bresnan, Bresnahan goes to the Giants and becomes very famous for uh, some of his tools of ignorance creations. McGinnity goes to the Giants and helps Christy Matthewson become the best player of all time. Uh, so, yeah, these guys get ripped apart pretty soon. Uh, the White Stockings. Uh, again, I don't know why they're down so low. I don't know why they did so bad last year. Uh, they picked up Tim, Tom Daly, who was the best second baseman last year for the National League. Uh, Mertes had a hell of a year last year, five homers, 78 RBIs. Pop Foster came over from Washington and hit just like he was supposed to. I think he did. Yeah, look, at he did better. 589 slugging with the White Sox, which is odd because their field should diminish that. Danny Green's coming from the Cubs, and he had a hell of a year with eight homers. Uh, you got Fielder Jones now uh, being center field, where he'll become dominant. And Sammy Strang from the White uh, from the Giants, uh, the small little man, Sammy Strang, uh, batting two sixty three, and he had uh, how many stolen bases? Twenty six stolen bases. So he should be running with abandon. Uh, and they picked up Ned Garvin. Uh, Ned Garvin, is he still destructive? It's all about him. Oh, he's selfish now. So he's not disliked. He's not disliked in Chicago, so he's not disruptive. And then Clark Griffith, we made him. He's the closer. So there you go. He'll he'll play a lot of relief. He'll probably spot start a lot. But uh, there we go. Washington Senators, they picked up. Look at what they picked up. They ripped off the Phillies as well. So they got Jimmy Ryan, the ageless wonder there in center field still. Wolverton, they picked up from Philadelphia, who had a hell of a year. Delahanty, they picked up Keister from Baltimore, who got dropped, which is odd. 330, four homers, 103 RBIs. So Keister is going to have a hell of a year. Grady, who hit 14 homers, still there. Boiler Kark, who is probably the best offensive catcher in the league. Uh, Cub Stricker, who I had here. Uh, Damn it, these freaking guys and their mustaches. We got Cub Stricker, who I had on here 
uh, one of the many players from the 19th century who are young enough to still play. I kept them in, uh, or and who had the ratings to still play. Look, he still does. He batted 296, so I just basically kept him in there. And then Bones, I'll, oh, for frick's sake, man. I really, I really don't know why these, these, uh, these mustaches disappear every fucking time. This is just like one of those things that should have been the first, you know, you just play it and somebody should have picked that up right away. But, you know, they tested it in modern day baseball. That's what they did. Uh, Casey Patton had a hell of a year last year. Al Orth came from Philadelphia, the curveless wonder, who has a nice split finger fastball. Waddy Lee did, oh, and eh, he didn't do so good. But uh, he'll probably go to the, he'll probably play outfield a little bit this year since the outfield is pretty old for the Senators. And then they have Cleveland finishing last. But little do they know that they're going to get a gift. They're going to get a gift. And this is the reason Van Johnson did this, because he knew that Boston was good. He knew that um, the Browns would be good. He knew Chicago was still good. And um, and Philadelphia was good with, under Connie Mack. So what he did is to bypass all that Philadelphia injunction, he gave Flick LaJoy to the Cleveland um, to bolster them for the good part. And that was a hell of a job. So he strengthened Cleveland astronomically, which is amazing. So he had, he had clear goals for what he wanted in the American league. And unlike the national league who had the pirates and everybody else, these guys had parody for the most part. Um, yeah, they got a whole bunch of guys. They still have Bradley here. Uh, Jack McCarthy, unsung hero. He always did well, but he's he's batting fourth, but he should be second. He, but they, they have nobody else, so they have to bat him fourth. That's just how it is. When they get LeJoy and Flick, maybe he'll change up to the second spot. I think they're getting Harry Bay, the fastest player in the uh, in the major leagues at this time. They'll get him for leadoff, which means Pickering will go, even though Pickering um, almost won the gold glove last year, or the, the golden glove. They have this horrible, the worst player of all time, unfortunately, and they have Shyback, who was their shortstop last year, now it's second base. Uh, but they do have Bob Wood, who had a weird year last year. He shouldn't be that good, but he had a hell of an offensive year. Uh, they got Dummy Taylor from the Giants. But Dummy Taylor will be uh, persuaded by Frank Byerman to jump back to the Giants pretty soon. Uh, of course, they have Addy Joss. We'll have to see how he does. He's three stars right now, potential to be four stars. Uh, and, of course, they have Earl Moore, uh, Crossfire. And if you keep the walks down, ooh, 130 walks last year. If you keep the walks down, he should be decent. But during this time, walks were, walks were a death sentence, especially if you, you – if you didn't strike out like 120, 120, 130 walks, maybe you could survive. But during this time, that was astronomical. So top 10 hitters, oh, he's supposed to be doing better than last year. Look at that, Nat Plasway. Heidrich is supposed to hit 420 this year. Burke at 380. Jack McCarthy, like I said, the unsung hero. He's supposed to slug. Maybe that's why he's batting fourth. Um, Daly's supposed to keep it up. Pickering's supposed to hit the next level. Uh, Strang is supposed to steal 58 bases this year with Chicago. Nice. Uh, Tom Hughes is going to continue his ways, probably unseating Cy Young. We'll have to see. Joe Yeager is supposed to be amazing this year. That's weird, but okay. And Bill Deneen is supposed to take it up a notch and uh, and do well for Boston. The National League, of course, look at see the Pirates. It's the Pirates and everybody else. Cincinnati is supposed to take the next step to try to challenge them, but 11 and a half games back is the prediction. That's Pittsburgh, of course. Uh, Barney Dreyfus was uh, a very, either intimidation or that they liked him, is why they didn't rip off a lot of his players. That will change next year. But during the first two years, they kind of left the Pirates alone. And they come back with basically the same team. Again, Wagner's playing in right field because they got Wid Conroy, the uh, gold glove shortstop from Milwaukee last year. So he's going to be playing shortstop. Um, George Merritt still around. Um, did a hell of a job in the World Series. 
and getting to, to that point until Lefty Davis came back. And, of course, Lefty Davis is now the key backup, and he's a hell of a player. So we'll see how that pans out. We'll see if uh, Wagner goes to shortstop pretty soon. The Reds, of course, the Reds got the MVP, Sam Crawford still. They got Beckley, um, who did not hit as well as he should have, but uh, he batted 278, but he's still batting there. And they picked up Dummy Hoy. And we'll have to see how Dummy Hoy uh, comes back from his key injury. They picked up Irv Beck from Cleveland, who did 284, six homers, 74 RBIs. Good 362 slugging from the second hole. Uh, Steinfeld is now back. He got, came. Uh, he was playing second base last year. Now he's at third, which is his natural position. So that's a good job. I uh, that's a good job just from uh, addition by subtraction, keeping it, getting him out of second base. And Herb Beck's a better second baseman, and putting him at third base where he's better. Uh, Corcoran, of course, is a light hitting shortstop, and Bill Bergen is just a offensive hole, but he does a hell of a job with the pitchers. Uh, Hans back. He's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to do a hell of a job this year. Phillips is back. Who overachieved last year? We'll see what he does. And Amos Rossi, they're giving him back his starting position after demoting him last year. And they picked up Ed Poole from Pittsburgh. I think he got traded for. Where did he get traded for? Oh, for twelve hundred bucks. So twelve hundred bucks they picked up Ed Poole, who they thought was a would be a key contributor and he did well one and three but he 3.07 era so we'll see how he he does there uh heisman had a hell of a year 189 in 38 innings pitch uh in real life he got dumped real quick but uh we're gonna keep him in there uh the bean eaters uh kid nichols was at this time they dumped him and he went to manage kansas city but in this one Nope, he did he did a good enough job to give me second chance. Now he might be he might be kicked out after this, uh, which means he'll end his career. He'll end his career with like maybe three hundred and thirty wins. Uh, Vic Willis should take the step up in real life. Vic Willis and Pittinger, I think, both won twenty seven games for the for the Boston Bean Eaters, so that's pretty amazing. Uh, they did dump Hamilton after this year as well. So the Bean Eaters released uh, two key players of their 19th century powerhouse, Nichols and Hamilton. This Hamilton got to the All-Star game, so I'm not going to dump them yet. Uh, Tanay, Cooley, uh, why they have Cooley batting third, who knows? Who knows? Herman Long's back after getting injured last year. We'll see how he does. Ah, uh, the bean eater or the superbos. Superbos basically come back with mostly the same guys. Uh, this Ed House householder is here. He's kind of a placeholder. He bet at three oh two with seventeen homers in Buffalo last year. So nice. Uh, Cozy Dolan, uh, two fifties batting third. Ugh, McCreary's a good home run hitter. Which, uh, but he also bats 300, so that's good. Deline is still here. Uh, Flood, they grabbed him from the minor leagues as well. He hit 310 with 13 homers. So I think my minor league uh, statistical output is off. They're hitting way too many home runs down there, but who knows? Irwin, uh, still one of the best defensive third basemen in the league, uh, lost in history. Uh, simply because he couldn't hit and he bounced around on teams. Huggy Hearn, yeah, this guy, one of the best players. He's one of that 1902 class. He's from Troy, New York, around here. Um, and in his obituary, they called him one of the best uh, catchers from lore, but he really never played more than 66 games. So another, another kind of sad sack uh, from 1902 where he died and they lied in his obituary. So... Uh, Donovan, Donovan's got to keep the walks down. Look at that, 158 to 109. So if he can keep it around that 109, 110, while striking out 200, he'll be a damn good pitcher. Kitson, Newton, Newton's still sticking around. Ed Scott, who was leading in ERA for a while in the American League, still around. And then you got the Giants. I don't know why they say the Giants are going to be this high. Look at the, these guys are just a bunch of journeymen, a bunch of bench players. I mean, Frank Bowerman is now batting cleanup. <laughs> and uh, Ganzel, 
he's nothing. Louder. He's a guy that bounced around the league later. Heidi Smith is one of those guys. He was the manager for a while in 1902 before McGraw came. Um, they had Horace Fogel uh, in the front office. And this guy, oh, no, 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 front office personnel. Ed Horace Fogel. This guy would later become the owner of the Phillies, I believe. And then he would be, he was either that or an umpire. But he would, uh, he would get kicked out of the league and banned for life because he said the umpires favor the Giants. So, uh, Phillies, Roy Thomas, the guy who walked 100 times all the time. But you have to wonder, what were pitchers afraid of him for? He hit 120 last year, even in the simulation. You can see this one. This is before the simulation. Six doubles, one triple, two homers. Hey, what is there to be afraid of this guy? Just throw strikes. <laughs> and uh, part of the reason was uh, back then the National League still did not have the foul strike rule. The AL adopted it right away, but fill it out, uh, but the National League did not adopt it until a couple of years later, which I think they did it in 1903. He still he still he still uh, walked and led the league in walks after it was implemented, but I just don't know why it was such an enigma why he walked so much. But give him credit. Um, Jennings is now at first base. Uh, they don't have anybody. They got a Hulswit who is a rookie here. Uh, never really amounted to something, but he had high hopes. A uh, Krug, another rookie. Um, uh, he died. Young in his 30s, I think. He died of tuberculosis or typhoid fever. Again, this rookie class, boy, man, these poor guys. Uh, and then the orphans, the orphans, I don't know, they still have Jack Taylor. Uh, Bunk, Bunk, here's another guy that had a, a, a poor, he just got traded to the wrong teams and he had a lot of talent, but he just never got the shot. They still got Bill Lang. Um, Bobby Lowe is at second base. He'll be replaced later by Tinker. Um, no, not him, not him, not him. Germany Schaefer. Germany Schaefer will lose his job most in real life. He lost his job, and then Tinker came up and started playing third base uh, before he went to uh, before he went to shortstop. And then when e Evers came up, and this is uh, 1902, September 13th is when Tinker's. Evers to chance became a thing. Now, most people call him Johnny Evers, but that was a mispronunciation. Technically, his, his name is pronounced Evers. But uh, so I may call him Evers sometime and Evers another time. I try to call him Evers uh, because that is how his name's pronounced. But he never really bothered uh, correcting people. So when they called him Evers, he was like, man, eh, whatever. Some people, people up in Troy call me that too. And Johnny Evers, of course, is a Troy native as well. So there you go. Along with King Kelly and all those other guys. So I have a lot of baseball history up here, which is why I fell in love with the dead ball era. But that's technically what happens. Germany Schaefer loses his job. They, they get Tinker, who was, and Tinker, again, another sad story. Uh, Never got a shot at managering, man, managerial stops uh, until Evers got it. So Evers would get the managerial stop because he was known as the smart one because Tinker was quiet. Tinker played in the Pacific Northwest League for Portland uh, prior to going to the Orphans, who would later become the Cubs next year. And um, and what would uh, what happened with him is he just. He got wrought by diabetes later in life, had to get his leg cut off, and he died a horrible death, Tinker did. So, and, but even before that time, Evers would get all the managerial chances. Tinker wouldn't. Tinker kind of get the short end of the stick in every kind of negotiations. So it was kind of, yeah, it's kind of bad, even though he was probably the better defensive guy at his position that Evers was at his. But uh, it just goes to show you, squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know. Quite unassuming men usually get uh, shut out. Uh, okay, so, and then the Cardinals are supposed to finish last. Now, Cardinals, all right, 1902, another rookie, Homer Doc Smoot. This guy, 
had fibromyalgia. Uh, it was called muscular rheumatism during that time. But he lived in constant pain, this poor guy. Um, he had a hell of a he had a hell of a career for four or five years, but then he just went downhill. His daughter said that during the end of his career, he'd sleep till noon to get because he was such pain. He had to build up he build up his strength in order to play that afternoon. In 1906, I think was his last season, and you can see it because he only stole two bases. Before that, he stole over 20, uh, but he could still hit. Uh, but later down the road, he died of meningitis. So there you go. So his rheumatoid arthritis, got, his rheumatism got so bad, and then he finally died of meningitis at an early age. Uh, God, man, it, it's just it's amazing. You go through all the rookies there this time. He's just like, yeah, died early, died early. Uh, lived with pain. Uh, yeah. Oh, poor guy. So these guys, I don't know. Stan Yerkes is. Decent pitcher so far, Ed Murphy as well. He's forgotten in history. And you got the O'Neill brothers, Mike O'Neill, his brothers Jack O'Neill, who's a backup catcher. Um, and these guys were the first uh, brother combination in Major League Baseball to pitch to each other in their very first starts. Um, except that this guy played last year. <laughs> so, th- but uh, this this guy was pretty o- pretty okay, Mike O'Neill. And um, Jack O'Neill were the two Irish brothers. They were born in Ireland. And then their family came over here and had another brother called Steve O'Neill. Steve is the famous O'Neill brother. Steve O'Neill played a long time for for Cleveland as a catcher and later become a manager. And his key thing was winning the World Series with the Detroit Tigers. So Steve O'Neill became a great man, uh, a baseball guy for 50 years, 50 years at least, maybe 60. And then they had another one, I think it was Jim O'Neill. He played shortstop for the Senators in the early 20s. Never really became anything. So that's the predictions. And the predictions here are, holy crap, Hamilton is supposed to hit 345 with 48 stolen bases? I don't know about this stuff. George Van Haltren, 361. John Titus of Philadelphia is supposed to Supposed to hit well, Keeler, Mike Smith of Boston. Mike Smith, wow. Fred Clark, Moose McCormick of the Giants. These guys are all, in the, most of them are in the minor leagues. That's very weird. And this is after spring training, of course. Uh, Shespro, uh, Pittsburgh, supposed to help, have a hell of a year. Looks like he is the favorite, 1.19 ERA. Whew. Tannehill, who did win the ERA title last year, I believe. Noodles Han, the pitcher, was he the pitcher of the, hold on, was he the pitcher of the year last year? Finished third, third and most, oh yeah, he did win pitcher, and he finished third in the most valuable player award. So Noodles Han, there you go. Uh, yeah, there you go. Vic Willis is supposed to do hell of a hell of a job this year. So we'll see how Vic Willis does. I'm really interested in that. He made the Hall of Fame much later in life when we finally scoured over all the stats during that time. And we went, yeah, this guy stuck around. He didn't really win as many as he lost, but all his peripheral stats were good. He just played on very bad teams. Um, except the Pirates when he played. Well, actually, when he played on the, when he finally got to the Pirates, they were waning down. So they weren't such a powerhouse. They were competitive, but they weren't the powerhouse they are now. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, let's look at now the top prospects. Well, I, no, no, no. Before we go to the top prospects, we'll look at player rankings. Uh, Lajway, Wagner, Donlin. Oh, Donlin. Uh, as you can see here, he's out for six months. Why? Because he's in jail. So I wanted to do that. Yeah, he got dumped by the Orioles because he went out, got pissed and had public urination, and he accosted a bunch of showgirls. So, yeah, that guy. Yeah, so he's out for six months, and he's on the same list. So he's in jail, technically. So he'll be back in six months with the Reds, who gave him a contract right after he got out. But he is the third best player, Sheckard, who had, uh, who's out for three months now. So he just seems like he's going to be our first bust. 
He's supposed to be a hell of a player, but uh, he didn't do so well last year. He did good, but he didn't do as well as he did in real life. And now he's out with a ruptured, ruptured tendon in his finger for three months. Uh, Flick, uh, Burkett, yeah, of course, Sam Crawford drops. I don't know how that happens, but okay. And the pitcher, Cy Young, still number one. Tannehill, Hahn, Matthewson. Matthewson had a, uh, I wonder if it does the news here. Does it news and violent player? Yeah. So he goes out, uh, ruptured ulnar col- uh, collateral ligament, which during that time they didn't even know what the hell that was. So he was out for that, thought he might go downhill. But then while he's still on injured reserve, this is very weird. He fell down a flight of stairs and got a fractured wrist. So he's out more time. So unable to play. And, and they're still saying it's his ligament there. So he's out five to six weeks. So I don't know if after that he goes out for the broken wrist or if that's just tied into it. I don't know. All right. Now we'll look at the top prospects. The top prospect, Gabby Kravitz. Gabby one of the top home run hitters of his time doesn't get any credit because all of his records for home runs in a gear, home runs in a game were later beaten quickly by Babe Ruth. So poor guy. Uh, but he also played, played in a band bowl. So most of his home runs were at home at Baker bowl and he hardly hit any on the road. So he's one of those guys that are like uh, Ned Williamson. So I don't feel so bad. Uh, Evers, of course, He's in AAA. Uh, George Stone, uh, this is where we get stone hands from. This guy had the defense capability of a statue. Uh, he would have been really good if uh, if during that time that was a designated hitter. He's the first player that if designated hitter was around, he would have been a hell of a player offensively. But, yeah, I don't I don't like defense uh, the defensive hitter, uh, the DH, the designated hitter. And it will never, ever, ever be in my league. All right, so Frank Schult, Schulte, uh, one of the guys that hit 20 homers, 20 things. I think Jimmy Rollins of the Phillies tied his stuff uh, down the road. So that's how long it lasted. Lasted until the 2000s. He hit uh, 20 homers, 20 doubles, 20 triples, and he stole 20 bases while hitting over 300, I believe. Uh, Hoffman, one of the key uh, utility players during the time. Titus, ooh, about 416 homers. I might call him up early. He's supposed to get his rookie part last uh, next year, but it looks like he's kind of uh, grown into his potential. He has. His contact's still down. So he's five of seven potential-wise. Five of seven discipline wise, but he might he might get a call up this year if injuries uh, will allow it. Lou Drill, like I said, he was one of the guys that actually lived to a nice ripe old age, became a public attorney. One of the few stories, uh, and then we, of course we got Moonlight Graham that just popped up, and uh, Moonlight Graham, George Brown, one of the uh, oh uh, another rookie, George Brown, who's on the Phillies right now, will be traded to the Giants. Spends about good amount of time with the Giants. Uh, yeah, his he's another sad sack uh, because he died young. He died of tuberculosis, didn't have the money Christy Mathewson had, so his friends had to raise stuff so he could go die Saranac Lake because we had the sanitariums up in here in upstate New York. Saranac Lake was one of the key ones. Uh, Germany Schaefer was another guy who died up there in Saranac Lake uh, sanitarium. Um, but uh, George Brown, his key, uh, his key came to... Claim to fame, and this is a tidbit you can hold. George Brown was the right fielder who was replaced by Moonlight Graham for Moonlight Graham's one game, one appearance, defensive appearance, no at bat. So if anybody asks you, or if you want to give a tidbit there, if you know Field of Dreams and go, you know who he replaced? A guy named George Brown. So <laughs> there you go. And George Brown is a rookie, um, one of the sad luck rookies that we have this year. Um, Lou Castro, another sad sack. This guy was, this guy's history is something. He's the first um, Latin American player to play um, 
from Colombia. Uh, now, Esteban Valero was one of them, but he was with the National Association. So if you want to play semantics, and Esteban Bland played up here with the Troy Haymakers, which is uh, near my hometown. I'm actually where the Troy Haymakers played. Their stadium is about eight, eight blocks from me. Maybe not even that. Four blocks. Four blocks away from me where they played. Um, and Lou Castro, a lot of people say he was uh, the son, which he changed his name to, of the horrible dictator of uh, Colombia during the time. Oh, or Venezuela, maybe. Maybe it was Venezuela, but and they changed his name and his. Uh, he said he was Colombian because of that. But a lot of people say he was just a, a son of a guy that was educated down there that escaped to New York City when stuff started going downhill, and uh, and Castro came with his father up here and became a citizen. So Lou Castro, but he never really became anything because he couldn't stay in the country. Um, for whatever reason, I think it was family issues. He had to go back. So his, his career got cut short because he, he just couldn't stay. He had to do other things. Personal life got in the way. Um, he didn't hit that well anyways. Um, top prospects, Ed Walsh. He'll be show, showing up pretty soon. Uh, piano mover Smith. Who else do we got? Uh, that I really know offhand that's. No, that's about it for the pitchers. These pitchers come and go in life. Uh, it's usually the, the players that usually stick around. Mike Mitchell, best arm in all of, from 1901 to 1920, this guy probably had the best arm outfield arm. He was the Ichiro Suzuki of the day. So other than that, that's it. George Moriarty, he'd become a manager. Yeah, Jack Tony, another one that become better for a coach. All right, so we will we will go into nineteen. We will go into April, and May. I think we're going to do. We're going to cut this down because I've already been speaking for an hour, which a lot of that's going to be cut because I was rambling. But we'll go into April and May, and we'll see how things go. Here we go. Okay, we're ending May so far. Um, or not? I'm sorry. We ended uh, April. I went up. A- a little above because I had to do some things. Um, Jack McCarthy is doing a pretty damn good job. He's betting 386. He had a nice little hitting streak going on. Uh, we Nat Blagway is now over with Cleveland. He and Bernard and Elmer Flick were traded. So let's we'll see how uh, Blagway does uh, as he is hitting with Philadelphia again this year. Three doubles, two triples, two homers already. Um, as a, yeah, not so good with the stolen bases, though. But uh, Cleveland was in the middle of the pack, six and seven, so we'll see how they go from here. And Philadelphia was seven and one. We'll see how far they drop. Again, Baltimore, like I said, they're, they have a great team. But it's about to be torn up. So they'll have another month where maybe they'll do some good. Uh, in Washington and Detroit, this is these are the two teams I thought were going to battle for last place uh, so far. The White Stockings, I wish they were doing a little better in 500, but we'll see. Uh, Hartzell is now leading stolen bases. Fielder Jones is up there. Wow, Jimmy Ryan's got five stolen bases. Old man can still run. Uh, Lav Cross, double... Uh, leading in uh, RBI with Harry Davis and Lat Lajoy. So it would have been a Philadelphia trifecta there. Uh, Lav Cross and Nat Lajoy were two of the hitters. Uh, they got Hemp Hill, but he's only batting 206. And he will be released pretty soon. And uh, Heydrich is actually up there with the batting average. Um, Harper comes over from St. Louis to St. Louis. And uh, he's, he's basically kicking butt where he left off. So that's pretty good. Uh, you don't see Cy Young here because Cy Young is not doing so hot. He's 2-2 two two with a 2.06. He only has eight strikeouts. So he's not really tossing the ball as, as hard as he did last year. So he may be aging pretty quick in this game. Uh, Addy Joss has three wins, so he's probably going to win all the Rookie of the Year awards. Uh, Earl Moore, yeah. 
uh, 17 walks, 14 strikeouts. That's where he should be for a guy that uh, uh, needs to learn control. Uh, Clark Griffith leading his saves. That's appropriate. I like that one because uh, he used to be – he used to just go in there after when he was managing and he'd just he'd go, all right, I'm taking over on the mound. Uh, Joe Yeager is actually doing a hell of a job there. Mm. So that is surprising. He should be getting a lot more home runs, though. Uh, in the National League, we'll look at the National League. Pittsburgh's just blowing everybody out of the water, 12-3. and three. It's it's astronomical. The Phillies are saying, we're not going out without a fight. It, it, it's really amazing how the Phillies are hanging in there. Uh, you got Roy Thomas. He's got a five, uh, well, 515 on base percentage, so he's on fire. George Brown's batting 460. Hugh and Jennings hitting 281. Uh, they got this new guy, Bill Clay, who's who's hitting 268, pretty pretty much doing okay. Um, Hallman is batting 214, 264, and Henry Gregg batting 222. Um, Chick Frazier is the big guy. He he's four and one now, 1.6 ERA. He said normality, and uh, you know I I found the solution to my ails, and uh, thank you for giving me another chance, Philadelphia. Um, except the Phillies, not the athletics. And Doc White is kind of going downhill, uh, but he's still three and one. Uh, they, they've had a number of pitchers in the third spot. So, but uh, yeah, they're doing okay. Maybe it's because the rest of the teams just kind of stink. The Giants are ugh, horrible. Cardinals, of course, are going to be bad. The Orphans are still bad. Uh, the Bean Eaters sticking in there. Reds are just riding the curtails of... Uh, the coattails. The Reds are riding the coattails of uh, Sam Crawford and Jake Beckley. So they're doing okay, but Crawford doesn't have any home runs anymore. That's amazing. His home runs just dropped right off. He does have seven triples, but his home runs have just not gone anywhere. Dummy Hoy's not doing as well either. The Cincinnati is just riding off the back of Noodles Han, who's 5 1, 1.7 1. Uh, Crawford, Beckley. That's basically it. Everybody else is kind of failing. Beck's not doing so bad at second base. Uh, but Russi is really getting helped under Bill Bergen. So that's pretty nice. Then you got Tannehill, 0.87. Jeez, man. Six wins. He is on fire. Uh, Noodles Hans got the strikeouts, of course. Uh, no, no saves. Uh, Brown, Crawford, Keeler. Keeler, 438. Not a lot of home runs to speak of. Hamilton still, wow. Did he get 1,000 steals? Nope, 923. We'll see if we can get that 1,000 steals. That would be freaking amazing. I don't think anybody will top it until maybe, maybe if uh, Ricky Henderson can, can top it. Uh, let me see. Uh, Rusi has a lot of, yeah, Rusi, not Rusi, Rusi. Rusi has a lot of uh, nice games here, striking out five, cruising to a sh shutout, striking out four. Oh, famously outspoken, huh? Extroverted to the extreme, outspoken. Ah, ha, ha. I like how the news stories actually do something like that. Uh... Yeah, so there there we go. So Big McPhee, this is nice. On the last out, Rusi appeared to celebrate a little too boisterously for St. Louis manager Patsy Donovan, who seen scolding the famously outspoken right-handers at the clubs of the field. 
Bruce's own manager intervened with words for his counterpart. The Cardinal skipper would not comment on the exchange, but the Reds at the Reds press came out. Uh, speaking to the Reds uh, with two reporters with pencils, uh, Rusi referred to his, that it was regarding the celebration. He basically told me I was being a lousy winner, Rusi said. And I told him he was being a lousy loser, Cincinnati manager Ben McPhee said. So that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, they had something where John McGraw retired. I did not like that. So I basically put him right back on the Orioles. 29 years old, you're going to retire? I, I don't get it. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think if we look at the league history, history index, managers, is he still accumulating wins? I hope so. I hope he is. That would piss me off if he just stays there and he's just at 172 forever. Uh, so I guess I have to cut off managers during the season and then just activate them prior. So... I mean, that's, I guess that's what we'll do. Global settings. If I just do that. Uh, mail and new, no, 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 news here. And hopefully, uh, when we come back, we'll see, we'll see something. And you can see Nat Blasway, uh, 16,000. Five-year deal, pretty good for a player that age. I think he's a number one. I think he's a number one player. Finance report, maybe. Yep, it'll show you. Uh, Jimmy Collins actually is the number one. It's the number one guy. They don't have Nat Blashway. Um, 2,500. Wow. Okay. So he's not, he's not even close. Okay. The league settings probably, uh, they probably just said, screw you. We're going to, we're going to change everything here. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't have changed. So, you know what? I'm, I, I'm actually going to go in there and I'm going to change that. Uh, we're going to change his, yeah. Uh, we're going to say 6,000, uh, 6, 2, and then 6, 5, and then 7,000 right here. There we go. Now when we do the finances, he should be the number one paid player. There he is, 6,000 bucks. That's till Honest Wagner gets his paycheck because Honest hasn't gotten his paycheck yet. But uh, let's see. Let's actually see what Honest is doing. Yeah, uh, he's not doing so well again. He's batting 250. It's very weird. So weird why he's batting so little, especially since he came in just being a powerhouse. Uh, All-Star, World Series MVP, World Champion. Oh. I guess they already have those custom awards now. So I have no idea what to do with that custom award. I should change that, huh? We can see it here. Let's see. All right, here we go. Look at this. Uh, we did have, I want to tell you that we did have two no hitters. Um, news listing, league newspaper, uh, Toys of Boston, blah, blah, blah. Come on. Uh, we had a uh, Sport McAllister is uh, kind of ticked over Detroit asking for a trade. And here it is. Sam Lever, the Goshen schoolmaster, got uh, 
a no hitter, and then Bill Deneen, first no hitter in American League history. Does not go to Cy Young. It goes to uh, Bill Deneen, who kind of faltered last year for Boston, had 25 losses, led the league, and now he's 4-5 and five for the Somerset. So that's pretty good there. Um, what do we got here? Mike O'Neill. Very nice. Five wins, two starts for St. Louis. Rookie of the Month. Andy Lawyer. Andy Euler. Oh, my God. Why would I say lawyer? 351, no home run, seven RBIs for the Orioles. So that's pretty good. Uh, Nat Blasway, uh, he's batting he's batting 457 now. So he's going downhill without that great ballpark over Philadelphia. Uh, Bobby Wallace, ooh, he just got hurt. That's not good. Uh, here, let me, see, let me see something here. Christy Matheson. Okay, let's look at this one. After what he called a particularly tough string of recent losses, uh, Matthewson is 0-2. He just got back from the disabled list. He's only 21. Called the players only meeting. Uh, some things that I'm festering for a while we need to take care of. Dude, you just showed up. You just blew your arm out, and now you're back. And you fell down the stairs. So I don't know what the Christian gentleman here, Christy Matthewson, is thinking. Um, big six. Named after a fire truck. Uh, getting looser and all this kind of stuff. Uh, then we have, there you go. Then we have Bob blew it. You blew it. <laughs> Said, uh, didn't work more than a distraction than anything. We're, we know we're not playing good baseball. We don't need to hear from one of the players. Ooh, I know Matthews and mean well, but there are probably some guys more upset now that they were before we had that meeting. So, uh, yeah, the New York is not doing so hot. Um, if we look, well, let's look at the American League first, of course. The Orioles, I will still be doing this, uh, blowing the Orioles apart just like they did in real life. It's going to be very, very interesting then to see who will make the World Series when I blow up the Orioles. I, will they overcome all odds? Will they be the feel-good story or will they plummet like a rock? That is the big thing. Will they plummet, and how far will they plummet? Uh, will it make sense to send them to New York next year uh, become, and become the Highlanders, or do we never have the Yankees? Ooh, that might be interesting. If they win the World Series as Baltimore, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we'll send them to New York, especially if they overcome all those odds. You never know. You never know. Um, Cleveland, of course, is bouncing back with Knapp and Elmer. and. Uh, Doug will be in, in, the, uh, in the rotation. The Browns are doing a hell of a good job with those old uh, St. Louis guys. Uh, Burkett, Burkett's uh, got three home runs. He's second behind Lajway in, in batting average, but the batting averages have plummeted, so that's good. I was kind of worried. Uh, stolen bases, uh, Fielder Jones got 14, so Sammy Strang only has 10. Let's see how many times he's been caught. Eight times. So that's not bad for uh, for the dead ball error. Uh, earned runs. Tom Hughes beginning. He still has his winning ways. Really working for Baltimore. Frank Foreman, age 39. Good God, buddy. You're doing a heck of a job. Let's see. But... You lost your damn mustache. Okay, so we got Foreman here. Deneen's doing a hell of a job. Cy Young coming up, coming aboard. Seven, three, and he's got a save. So he's doing okay. Addy Joss is up there. That's very nice. Uh, strikeout Cy Young's. Trying his best to stay up with the young guys. Hey, he's still a five-star potential five-star pitcher. Jake Powell uh, did it in St. Louis, and now he's doing it for St. the Browns. Six and four. Got a whole bunch of one-save people. 
uh, runs scored. Of course, the Broncos uh, with uh, Elmer Flick and Matt Blasway there. Batting average, the Browns, of course, Hydrick and Burkett here, there. Home runs, the Athletics are smacking them, no doubt. I mean, good God, how many they got? Lave Cross. And this is even before, Sox Seabold is slumping badly. And he has no home runs, but yet uh, these guys are, are doing it for him. That's pretty nice. Okay. Uh, let's see, ERA, Orioles, Orioles, bullpen, ERA. Um, defensive, defensive efficiency are the summer sets. So that's pretty nice. Head and shoulders above the Orioles there. On base percentage, the Bronchos. Stolen base, of course, the White Stockings. Jeez, they're just running amok. Uh, for the National League, what do we have for the National League? The National League are uh, the Pirates running away with it, unfortunately. So Brooklyn, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Philly, eh, most don't have a shot. Philly, Philly got off to a good start, but nothing now and of course the giants are just they're out of it they're, they'll be out of it real real quick here which is nice to see where they had that uh member only meeting uh meet the team christy matthewson van haltron's hurt again by the way so he's got a broken hand he's out two to three months dummy taylor came back and jumped over to the the giants again uh top player look at this their, their players are just ridiculous joe beans the worst shortstop jack dunn the worst third base heine smith the worst second baseman i'm batting 188 ganzel worst first baseman bowerman worst catcher even though he's hitting 290 and then matthewson's the seventh best um fan loyalty is pathetic so far i like how they have this they have the career team leaders and with the nl it's pretty nice got hits and home runs roger connor jack glass glasscock games played uh mickey welch um and R rossi who's still wow still still the man even though he's over in cincinnati doing well um, and you can see the chemistry they're content right now Yeah, I don't know. Why is Blewett? Oh, he's leader. He's a leader. He's an outspoken leader. I mean, Taylor, hi. Uh, so these are the guys that really help that along. Yeah, Matheson, Blewett. Matheson's a captain. These guys. Well, what are you going to do? Not ready at the moment. Contact on it. Okay. I had to cut off the coaches, which really sucks. But what are you going to do? Oh, you got wins. Tannehill. Donovan's 0.85 now. These are ridiculous ERAs. I hope they balloon up pretty soon. No saves in the National League. Killer betting 434, Browns betting 418. Crawford now has four home runs, so he came alive, and Wagner is coming alive right now. Keeler leads in stolen bases. Well, and so that's it. Uh, I mean, we have, you know, Sheckard's out again. Parent is out. Uh, Carney Greminger's out for Boston. Uh, Magoon and Donlin out for Cincinnati. Gleason and Casey. So Detroit has lost two key players there, and they can't afford to lose any of them. Van Haltern out again. Oh, Wagner's day-to-day. -day. Uh, Deacon Philippe is out. Burkett's day-to-day -day for four days. And Wallace is out for three weeks, which is not good. And Homer Smoot out for four weeks, showing that uh, he does have that injury-prone trait. All right, so we'll come we'll come back. We'll get uh, our next one will be from June to July. We'll get the trade deadline going. 
I will so, so, so see who makes out, and we'll see what happens to the Orioles. Thank you for joining me. Take me out to the ball game.